thanks everyone for coming uh, to the extraordinary seminar we're having today. So it is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor uh, Jorge Ernesto Corba, um, who is visiting, visiting us from the Instituto Astronomico e Geofisico at the Universidad de São Paulo in Brazil. So um, uh, Dr. did his PhD at the Universidad de La Plata and afterwards went on to do some postdocs in Sao Paulo, uh, Rice University and University of Arizona, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, apart from his uh, full professorship, uh, now in the University of Sao Paulo, he has also been the founder and director of the nucleus of research in astrobiology between 2011 and 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Fortunately, I'm <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> And well, that's all I have. So I'm sure it's gonna be a great talk. So go for it, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Eu vou dizer primeiro que estou muito frustrado. Eu tinha aprendido português para rebater o, o, os elemos aí, mas eu vou ter que fazer isso em inglês, que não é a mesma coisa, mas tudo bem. Tá. É, ok, we'll go uh, up there. Thank you for Alex and Aze and, and all of you for this opportunity to communicate some. Uh, inter I believe that this interesting news about compact objects in the galaxy, mm -hmm. real ones. I believe that you're more interested in. Um, uh, uh, gravitational aspects of uh, uh, neutron stars and black holes and so on. But I'm going just to uh, th uh, talk about real, actual measurement objects and problems about uh, before modeling and then. So you probably will have a lot to say about gravitation and many other things inside. So, um, this is my first, I drew it several, several years ago. Rice trying to tell that science is about modeling, but the model has captured at most uh, the most uh, fundamental range, uh, which are not uh, usually uh, the right ones, but rather uh, a sketchy picture. And therefore, but nevertheless, this is our task. This is reality. These are black holes and, and whatever. And this is what we think they are, which is, uh, you know, a toy model in, in some senses. But nevertheless, we would try to uh, think about them as uh, in science, we, we are used to, we are taught that there are no dogmas. Okay, there's nothing to do with the science is all about dogmas. So you uh, create a dogmatic picture of something, and very, very, very seldom you realize that your dogmas are religious dogmas, they are ideological dogmas, and so on, but there are dogmas in science too. And they are uh, very difficult to put down because they are repeated over and over for the students over generations. And that's the process that uh, our friend Thomas Kuhn uh, named the scientific revolutions in which you question the dogmas and something changes uh, irreversibly. And then you start to uh, change your way of looking at that. Therefore, I will start with some dogmas that you really probably will uh, know very well, you know very well, and uh, started with uh, the, the hyper famous event in uh, of the Crab Nebula uh, pool. The, the Crab Pool, sir, I uh, mean, the Crab uh, explosion. Here's the guy getting some tea, of course, because it, they were, it was very well um, related and registered by the astronomers of the Sung dynasty. And there's a picture which is uh, somewhat contrived of the character Henry III. Immediately taking a look at something that looks like a supernova, but it's not nobody knows. So there are no confirmed registers in 1054 uh, in Europe or even in Byzantium uh, of, the, of the supernova. Whereas at the same latitude, more or less, the Chinese have their detailed records because there were people uh, formed to take a look at the skies and they, they had a lot of meaning. Therefore, there you see that the sociology and the politics of the country influences on what you see and what you don't see. And that's a, a sign that the dogma is there. So when you crab, when crab was observed in, uh, at that time and in the modern era was rediscovered but many uh, obscure points appear in that observation. So this is uh, the crab and this is a typical true supernova remnant of Cassiopeia in the way. And I point out that these two things are not the same. Contrary to what you, we say to the students and we lie, you know, fiercely to them, say, 
the example of supernova producing neutron stars is the Crab Nebula, but the Crab Nebula is not a supernova ring. It's rather a pulsar with nebula, in which the central pulsar is uh, putting away radiation that uh, by fluorescence uh, ionizes all the gas around. And the real difference is that if you take a look at a real supernova ring and you find around 10 solar masses, but direct counting. Whereas if you take here in the crowd and try to uh, collect all the mass, which is around, is something between one and there are claims that goes up to seven solar masses. And therefore, what we see is not the massive star envelope uh, over there. Nobody knows where, where is it. And there is a chance that the upper limit is uh, realized that is, is a kind of explosion we can probably understand, but not in the way we see and say and uh, affirm uh, in uh, astronomy courses, for example. And when you say it was a very massive star, gets an iron core, whatever, boom, blows out, and so on. But this is not like that. So the paradigmatic supernova explosion is anything but the crab <laughs> So when you want to show something to the students, show Cassiopeia, in which the neutron star is here, uh, it has the poles, but anyway. Um, and uh, we have to take a look at the uh, crab to see what the, what is uh, was really about. So 154 was a very difficult year for everybody in the uh, Roman uh, in the Byzantine and the world, because it was the uh, year of the great uh, schism. So Pope Leo uh, died in July 4, um, three months after that, the supernova exploded. Therefore, there were some registers to try to prove that the pole was doing whatever he could to avoid this split of the church, the Orthodox and Roman church. Uh, this means that you have to distort the life curve of the uh, supernova or to say that the pole was died, but not so much till three years. Uh, therefore, to interpret the blow out of the crab nebula as a sign of the holiness of the Pope. Um, this is the emperor that uh, say and did nothing, even though there are some coins by uh, showing Constantinos monochromos uh, with some spots up there that somewhat interpreted as the signal of the supernova. There's no written record about that, even though they could, they had plenty of, uh, you know, the latitude of the elevation of the supernova and so on was uh, more than enough to take a look at that. But Byzantium was not a mystical um, uh, civilization. Therefore, they did not see the skies as selling, uh, you know, uh, messages or signals of, of, of what's, called, what's going on. And therefore, uh, the supernova passed uh, unnoticed. Um, Recently, uh, if you are to believe on something, you have to believe in the Chinese record, which are very, very detailed by professional scholars. And they show something incredible, that the supernova decayed from the starting observation uh, four magnitudes in, four, in three weeks, which is unheard of. So it's a very, very rapid dimming. And therefore, uh, I put forward some time ago that the idea that the supernova explosion was not the supernova explosion, rather a, a precursor followed by a, a true collapse explosion of the type that the Hans Thomas Janka and company calculated, in which the light curve was something like this. And it complies with the idea that uh, the daily visibility uh, was lost after 20 something days, but nevertheless, it was seen at night. Uh, for many, many months. Um, it, that it means, on the other hand, that a popular hypothesis will back in a minute that the explosion was not a very massive star, but rather a smaller star, uh, not creating an iron core, but rather or what is called an electron capture supernova, is wrong. Because uh, if you superpose in this diagram the uh, light curve of an electron capture supernova, it will go well up the daily visibility, which is against the data. The data is very scarce, but it's, it's, it's reliable. It's non-telescope non data. So I believe that the key of the guy helped 
to uh, you know that uh, a trained astronomer today can tell out easily uh, a quarter of an uh, variation at mega eye. Therefore, the Chinese were probably in that ballpark, and there, there's no uh, reason to doubt that. Therefore, maybe that what we that what they saw uh, in uh, 1054 was not the explosion of a supernova, rather first a precursor, a very bright one, followed by a supernova of a type which is still to be determined. Okay, so the dogma is is uh, still uh, mysterious. There's another one. You you probably uh, read anywhere that the supernova releases some um, 10 to the 51 Earth. And this unit is, is so um, common in astrophysics that uh, Adam Burrs and many others have given them a name, which is one Bitti, or Hans Bitti. Uh, Bitti was a, a pioneer of that. And so they were wanted to uh, name 10 to the 51 Earth equal to one bit. Okay, fine. So what what will you do with supernova to go much, much, much higher than that? So we have evidence right now of supernova uh, releasing 20 or 30 times as much energy. Where does the energy come from? So it's it's a it's a real mystery. So actually, there are these are a collection of proofs in which the normal ones are superposed to the so-called uh, uh, superluminous supernova. And superluminous supernova probably came, came from three different sources and they are all mixed together and therefore be difficult uh, to tell out uh, at once which one is it. But first is the collision of the shock wave sent into the dense and in the, uh, interstellar medium. And then you... Um, convert kinetic energy back to radiation when the collision happens. Therefore, all the kinetic energy is not wasted in a sense, but rather a fraction goes back into radiation and then you see uh, okay. very, very high luminosities. The second one is the creation of a magnetar. I mean, to the, the collapse produces a highly magnetized compact stars that is spinning very rapidly. And therefore, it goes, it, it rejects energy and pushes the supernova using a higher luminosity than it would be without it. Um, there's a very interesting paper in 1969 when I was in, you know, a small kid in school by Jerry Ostrike and said, do pulsars uh, make supernovae? And, and he has that, that idea that the supernova was not the result of shock wave, whatever, but rather the injection of energy of a rapidly rotating pulsar at a dipole that uh, by pointing flux uh, gives uh, a push onto the 10 solar masses or so. Therefore, maybe hidden here, there's a new version of the same stuff after 50 years, uh, maybe. Uh, the third thing is the so-called pair instability supernova. So around 200 and something solar masses, uh, there's an instability uh, annihilating the uh, electrons and positrons and therefore converting into photons and therefore a photon ball uh, is, is uh, likely to be the explanation of some. So probably the ones with a wide, uh, very slowly decaying uh, light. Therefore, supernovas are not always releasing 10 to the 51 Earths, but rather uh, a scale of the 10 to the 51 Earths for normal ones, but there is a superluminous supernova group that has been studied for the last 10, 15 years, in which there clearly show signs of more energy being involved by some different processes than the ones you uh, read in the book, including mine. Um, here's, uh, I'm not going to to put a lot of emphasis here, it's a superluminous works in the, in the last slide, but there are um, versions of supernova, that essentially the same mechanism in the core, but rather different outcomes because the star has lost, for example, the uh, the hydrogen envelope or even the hydrogen, the hydrogen and helium envelope and therefore the explosions and the spectra are very different that those are uh, called hypernovae and possibly related to gamma ray bursts and other uh, explosive phenomena. But uh, there's a, you know, a variety of supernova we really don't start to, to understand and right now. The third dogma here is the neutron star 
are produced by the collapse of a massive star, which is probably not true. Because uh, over the years, people has insisted that they have white doors, which the ones you love because they are very simple. And there's a Fermi gases plus uh, ions uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, it may be that if you accrete matter into that, there are situations in which the M dot, therefore the out input of the mass, uh, is enough to for the electron captures to be quicker than the thermonuclear ignition. Therefore, the carbon inside does not get ignited, but rather the thing collapses because the electron capture is uh, retires or uh, sucks uh, pressure from the wave. And therefore, the white dwarf implodes and produces a, a neutron star with a, a few ejection of 0.1 solar masses and 0.2 or something. This is uh, so-called the accretion induced collapse. And this, why is it interesting right now? Because it has to happen, but we don't know why. If an, uh, people have, was worried about the composition of the ejector over the years, because if you made a simulation and inject 0.1 and 0.2 solar masses, of very, very range, strange isotopes in the, in the galaxy, then uh, you will blow out all the winds that you have from uh, conventional spectroscopy. But nevertheless, now uh, there is the idea that the ejection is zero or, 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 or almost zero. And also the idea that two white doors make coalesce, like in gamma ray bursts or gravitational waves, but two white doors could coalesce and therefore span a neutron star mass of a much wider range than we used to be for a single uh, uh, white. And therefore, there is the possibility of possibly um, forming very heavy neutron stars out of a couple of pairs of, of white dwarfs, provided the M dot, the effective M dot in the case of a, a couple of them gets uh, high enough, okay? Why is it important? Because this goes to the next dogma. The next dogma is, is oh, sorry, that. Um, the dogma is the, that supernova from massive stars stem always from the collapse of iron core. However, uh, we are, uh, there are many, plenty of calculations, those are from Caroline Doherty in, in Budapest right now, that, um, the boundaries up to which you produce a uh, white dwarf or start to form an iron core that ultimately will collapse and produce a conventional uh, supernova are followed by the range in which the electron capture supernova is the way to explode. Therefore, there, there is uh, the, this mass in up is here and then uh, then you come to the idea this around, this is solar metallicity. Therefore, you see that around there's a convergence at mean between 7.5 and 8 solar masses of the calculation. This is the very old estimate by Eco Even and, and company. And therefore, this is where the uh, you know, statement that are above 8 solar masses uh, stars do not form uh, white dwarfs, which is uh, you know, somewhat very dependent on metallicity and quite dependent on the model, by the way. But say it's here. Here, the iron core mass is the other limit, but it is not anything below nine solar masses for solar metallicity. Therefore, there is a range here in which the so-called super asymptotic giant branch evolution leads the uh, core, which is oxygen magnesium uh, neon of the star, at a fixed mass to collapse and to produce a live neutron star plus an explosion. And that is the kind of uh, proposal that Nomoto had for the craft, given that the mass is very low and, and so on. And there's another thing here. If you remember that the number of the star goes swiftly down with uh, mass, the number of them in this range will be much, much higher than all the integrated range uh, from nine to infinity or whatever. Therefore, they should be there, but we are not still sure what, uh, which kind of events they produce. And here is more news, uh, 2018 ZD uh, has been identified one of these examples of electron capture events very uh, recently, in which the, uh, not only the 
collapse uh, goes on with a shock wave and so on, but there's also oxygen fusion energy release. So this is some, something in between, between a core collapse and a uh, thermonuclear supernova, because the oxygen burns and adds considerable, considerable uh, energy to the explosion. So here's the supernova, here's the uh, follow-up, and the uh, authors say that the electron capture into, at the generic core uh, is the progenitor is identified prior to explosion. There's a constellar material that you study and uh, complies with the abundances, the chemical composition, the energy, the light cure, which uh, the explosion energy is, is slow. This is on the ballpark until the 50 hertz. Therefore, it's subluminous in the sense of your scale of 10 to the 10 to the and of course in inclusivity. So therefore, if this is uh, an electron capture supernova and many other, there should be many other examples that are still not sure what we are, we are talking about. Then we come to dogma number five, which is a very strong, which says neutron stars have a mass of 1.4 solar masses. We have been working over the years when uh, you, I, I entered the PhD program, there was, a, you know, nobody doubted that neutron stars have 1.4 solar masses. You, uh, the available evidence was something like this, that they, okay, this is compatible with a Gaussian peak with 1.4 plus minus 0.1 or so solar mass. When time goes uh, by, then you start to collect more and more evidence because of the improvements in the X-ray data and many other things that collects data from binary systems, essentially. And this is a compilation by my student, Lydia Rocha, which has now 105 solar mass, um, neutron star masses measure. And you see that not only the 1.4 has enormous dispersion, and so it's becoming suspicious, but not even the double neutron stars are compatible with the old value anymore. So those, these ones are the binary pools or who stayed or whatever, but there are some of them which are extremely asymmetric. So one very heavy neutron star and the other very light neutron star. So it's a very exact, uh, take a look that the error bars are inside the point. Therefore, uh, on the ballpark of the millennium, millennium uh, 10 to the minus three or so. Okay. So now we have to worry, what are the lessons? Well, where are the good form? Um, do they gain mass in binaries? So I mean, that these confirmed points over two solar masses are all of them results from accreting matter in a binary systems, or there is maybe uh, some way of producing them as heavy as they are. Um, of course, what does it mean for the constitution of this matter? Because you, then you have to go up to above two solar masses and so, which is a problem for the theoreticians, because you have to put something, uh, some equation of state, which is very stiff. Uh, otherwise, the maximum mass will stay below two solar masses or less. Well, we have analyzed this uh, pretty much at the same time, me and collaborators and Chengin Zan and Ferial Ozil and Kixi Tan company, a few years ago, started to analyze that, suggesting a mixture of Gaussians and therefore um, reconstruct, reconstruct the mass distribution with three Gaussians uh, the first one was motivated the physics of the, that uh, oxygen, magnesium, neon. We didn't find any evidence for a small peak, which should be there. Uh, I will return to that. But there's the, a normal peak, and normally we say canonical. Say canonical, there's nothing canonical there because you have a lot of neutron stars here, maybe 30% or of, of, of so of the sun. And uh, whereas this uh, peak is very, very narrow, the, the third one, I mean, the, the one, at the highest masses is very wide. So we need to ideally to connect the formation mechanisms to the uh, mass distribution, uh, taking into account the history of all the binary. Some of them are, are known to have transferred a lot of mass. Some of them are not. For example, the binary pulsars are supposed to have no transference of mass uh, or no accretion whatsoever. That's why uh, they are fixed in mass, uh, not eccentric, and many other things. So it means that in some cases, you can blame the accretion. And in some other cases, you are 
you know, against the uh, observations if you bl try to blame accretion coordinates? Well, we did, a, this is very easy to do. So it's a fragmented analysis. So uh, I say one peak, two peaks, three peaks, and compare the cumulative uh, distribution and so on. And there's no way to sustain that there is a single mass scale plus minus uh, a sigma. There's at least evidence for two peaks, which is the one, which are the ones I, I saw. It should be at the third one, but we couldn't find it. But nevertheless, it means that the uh, distribution of masses is, is at least bimodal and not unimodal, uh, as uh, was thought uh, 30 years ago. Um, when you take a look at very naive look at the problem of the maximum mass, I mean, which is which is the wait, which is this value here, which is the maximum mass, which is related to the theory. The theory says that you have a maximum mass because of Tolman open behavior or uh, instability or equivalent if you have one because there are theories, uh, gravitational theories that, that do not present a maximum mass, which are interesting or absurd according to uh, who, who you talk to, right? So in, in general relativity, we understand very well what happens at the maximum uh, when the pressure terms is comparable to the density of energy and therefore the uh, gravity gets so strong that the sequence of stars goes down. Uh, this is not so, uh, this is not you know, compelling in, for example, uh, brain work theories and modified gravity sampling. Uh, quantum gravity effects may modify that is under discussion and so on. So that's the, the kind of things that you love, I, I know. And uh, someone uh, has to clarify all this situation, which is very, very messy because of the many theories, many ideas on the market. And however, that now we have some data, which is helpful in that sense. Okay, so uh, my David, go ahead. Yes. Uh, they should be because it corresponds, it should correspond to the light neutron star generated by the collapse of the oxygen magnesium uh, stars, stars around a nine solar mass. Right, right. So the electron capture supernova should be and produce a lot of neutron stars with a fixed mass, which we don't find. So the problem is what the hell is going on? Because uh, the live new the live progenitors are more much more abundant than the 20 or 30. Therefore, for us it's a surprise not to be able to identify clearly the presence of narrow peak at 1.25 kilometers. I will return to this, uh, but th this is why. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, that's a good question. So you mean if you, if the formation? Uh, no, no. I just say the observed distribution you're comparing to constant. Those are the galactic the binary systems. I'm not talking as yet about the possibility of finding any uh, bursts of uh, gravitation issues, which is of course extremely important and and maybe an effective source of new data because it's very difficult to. Uh, pick up and measure accurately uh, by conventional methods the masses because they depend on you know the inclination so or some, something tissue there then you have to model things and you're never pretty on this and so that uh, all all of them are related to the binary nature however as you probably you, your observation says the gravitational waves is, is a completely different method because in the chair mass then the observation is uh, the mass, the individual mass can be modeled because you have to match the waveform and therefore the masses come out with uh, certainty, with uh, accuracy. And they do not depend on anything geometrical or eclipses or whatever. Okay. So it, it will be a, a bless to have a lots of systems. Uh, like the GW170817, but there, there's only one confirmed, two or three in the O3 run, and maybe more to come because they're starting to take data again. Okay, so that will take us 
tell us something about the extragalactic population of, of neutron stars, but not the ones we have around, which is, by the way, I claim that we have more than 100 cases, but the, you know, the shy estimate is around 10 to the 8 neutron stars in the galaxy. Therefore, we have to reconstruct a whole distribution out of 100 uh, samples. It's, uh, as I told you, it's, it's like entering an, an, a bus and try to reconstruct the whole population of the country based on what you see. You count the number of peaks and elders and whatever, and then you say, okay, the phase distribution is like that. Of course, there's you know, <laughs> a lot of things that you, you don't know, but this is the situation we're faced in the combat objects uh, field. But okay. Yes. But aren't there any observational biases? Oh, there are lots of observation biases. So and that's the, the, the business of the astronomers. Tell everybody that, yeah, the guy's analysis is wrong, mine is okay, and uh, experimental piece. But there's a lot to be learned about, uh, for example, um, elements that you think you need for, for example, heat. Uh, in the uh, bird, when you observe a binary system, it's always that it's, it's, it's bound, it's not unbound. But most of them should be bound at the birth of the second neutron star. Neutron star have to isolate uh, Distribution of uh, velocities that peaks around 400 kilometers per second. Therefore, after a few millennia, even if you Take a look at the remnant in which the neutron star was born. The, the neutron star probably has pushed, no? has uh, punched a hole and, and went away. Therefore, the association of both things is, becomes impossible. And that's why we, we know, uh, I don't know, dozens of associations, but there is uh, 300 uh, remnants identified in the galaxy. Few of them are conserve their, their neutron stars because they tend to have a like, large kick at birth. And we really don't know why. It is probably uh, uh, related to the microphysics at the uh, moment of birth, uh, probably neutrino issue. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's a big problem to try to match up things and to understand why you don't see more associations and, and to try to, to understand why it was. Well, this is a very, uh, I will make a very bold statement, very easy here. If you take a look at the uh, distribution we suggest and reconstruct, at three sigma, the maximum mass will be something like 2.5 solar masses. Just saying, okay, so at three sigma, uh, the maximum you can find is like that. They say, okay, is that so? They say, okay, you can do better. You can do Bayesian um, analysis put a cutoff as an additional parameter, try to fit everything, now the location of the peaks plus the sigma, plus the location of a cutoff. And then fortunately for us, the uh, cutoff number is exactly the same. However, since this is Bayesian analysis, the uh, maximum can be slow, uh, lower or higher. Here, around here is the uh, rose of limit. Therefore, the uh, complete uh, the the uh, statement here is, is is the following: If you take a look, not at the single star, but rather at the whole distribution, your predicted maximum mass will be two point five solar masses, not two, not two two point two, but rather two point five solar mass, dangerously close to the upper limit of the causality for the simplest models of roads and. And then uh, I try to convince the guys, everybody, that it's useless to get one point and say, okay, the maximum mass must be at least that deal. Because in the whole distribution, you have more information. Unless you are doing things completely wrong, which is not, <laughs> not, not, not crazy, maybe. But this is the uh, uh, contention. Um, a few years ago, two years ago, we... Uh, collected a specific set of binary system, which is called uh, spider system, red bag, black widow, which are strongly interacting, very short orbits, 
uh, very contrived history in which there is a feedback from the accretion toward X-rays to the, the primary that makes it nonlinear, it's, it's a mess. But the real thing is that when you get the stage of what we call Black Widow, the accelerated pulsar wind starts to blow up the companion. Therefore, when you take a look at these systems and try to reconstruct them, as you find this, that they go all the way up to predicted value. If you, you're an astronomer, you, you look at that and say, okay, this says that these systems have accreted less than these ones and less than these ones. And probably there are some black holes here in the range. It's compelling to have a black hole over here, but it may be that black holes, real black holes start at 2.5 or 2.6 solar masses or so, because uh, if that's the maximum mass, everything that you, you push, they start slightly above that and then it collapses. And therefore, this is an idea that, that the small uh, uh, black holes may exist in nature. However, uh, there are new works in which gamma rays says that the, these points are, are not that heavy and push them around to two solar masses, therefore I'm not insisting too much on this. Why uh, is this important the electron capture again? Because uh, there's a parametrization of the binding energy, which is very simple by Latimer and Prakash, a company, company, and therefore it says that the core, the oxygen magnesium neon core of a light star, uh, it has a difference, which is, of course, the binding energy that leaves you with a fixed mass mutants. Uh, now, what do you really observe? In that plot there, over there, there are two, no one, but two systems that display the lowest mass you observe. Very well measured. These are two neutron stars. The neutron star 1.17 solar masses. Therefore, there's a, a, a lesson to be learned here. If you try to form the light and neutron star, which are they, these ones with the iron, the, the, the oxygen, magnesium, neon cores, you cannot. Therefore, it's unbelievable because the lighter progenitors cannot produce the lighter neutron stars. So to produce a very light neutron star, you have to start an iron core. And st iron cores start around nine or maybe more solar masses or so. Therefore, small iron cores come from progenitors of nine solar masses of so. And this kind of neutron star should be probably associated with these ones, with the masses which are small, but not so small, so as to explode by uh, electron capture uh, mechanism. Okay, there's a dogma here that will blow your minds, as mine, which is the, the formation of neutron stars is followed by black holes above a certain threshold. So there is a limit up to which you uh, have a progenitor of 20 something solar masses that produces neutron star. Therefore you start to produce black holes and then you produce black holes at once. Right? And this is an old um, figure from Hager, Woodley and company in which they put these numbers at 25. So you produce neutron stars up to here. Then you produce black holes that uh, fall back here. And then you produce a, a black hole all, all the way down with a full progenitor mass over 40 solar mass. But now we have oscillations and it shows, for example, that in NGC 6946, uh, 25 solar mass disappears suddenly in a few years and many, many hundred missing stars in the sample of fun stars. Uh, and therefore this idea that there's a definite limit up above which you uh, collapse to a black hole is wrong. It's, it's completely wrong. Uh, it, it's even worse than that. Uh, the idea is that when you go and make simulations, the origins of uh, this is single star explosions, then you have 20 solar masses here, and then you produce a lot of black holes here, and then you start to produce neutron stars again. This is an interplay between convection and many other things uh, in the interior. Therefore, take a look at that. This 25 solar masses that appear may have uh, uh, corresponded to a progenitor here in which a black hole is produced. But this does not mean that around 30 or more solar masses, neutron star will not produce uh, again. So it's not monotonic. It's, uh, it's some uh, you know, funny way intermittency uh, I put here. When you go to the 
uh, binaries, binaries, which are binary, why binaries are important? Because binaries, the prescription is that you take out uh, from the simulations, the whole hydrogen envelope and blow out what is left. And then the thing is much worse because the, not only the black holes are produced intermittently, but you can produce neutron stars of very, very heavy mass at around 40 or 50 solar masses, depending also on metallicity and so on. Therefore, in both single and double star explosion, the black hole formation is not monotonic with the mass. There's no limit up to which you produce neutron stars and then you produce black holes. It's, it's the other way, way around. So depending on a lot of microphysics factor, uh, and of course the observation back up that, uh, it may be that we, the formation of black holes and neutron stars is not uh, ordered in, in that uh, sense of uh, progenitor masses. Okay, so it's, it's pretty disturbing, isn't it? <laughs> David, is, is it pretty disturbing? Okay, fine. <laughs> now it's a, a bit of, of something that you can tell me uh, more than 10 minutes. Oh, it's more than that. Um, this is the, uh, a lot of uh, theoretical models, uh, all them with, within general relativity, reconstruction of the masses of nicer and other things here. And then the mass scales that you have confirmed for individual objects and the three spiders that reach this band. And therefore, 2.5 is our favorite number to, uh, to say. If you have a sequence of uh, models, then your maximum mass will should be there. But oh, be careful, because also uh, the radius has to be uh, large enough because we now know that the radius already are not 10 kilometers or so, but rather around 12. For, and they uh, pretty much the two solar masses and 1.4 solar masses measured by NICER have the same radius or compatible with the same radius. Therefore, it, it means that the that the, the field of, of models goes up very, very steep. It cannot be something very so smooth like it. Therefore, you rule out uh, soft models at once. Um, what about black holes? I told uh, Zay I, I was uh, going to say something. If black holes are even worse than neutron stars in the sense of measuring them because black holes sometimes help by, uh, you know, uh, accreting, but sometimes like in these cases collected by Jerome Ross. A uh, few years ago, you have 16 systems or so. Now we are fortunate that the, uh, we have uh, collected more uh, systems. At that point, the uh, me, uh, the Gaussian heat was 7.8 point plus nine or something. And therefore you have no black holes between two and five solar masses or no objects. Okay, no objects. Therefore, this gave rise to the dogma number seven, which is called the lower mass gap hypothesis which says there are no objects between two and five solar masses because you don't observe it. Okay, this uh, has been going over the years. We call it a desert gap. So it's the depletion, the complete depletion. There's nothing in between two and five solar masses by hypothesis. Therefore, people started to, uh, you know, put up reasons for the absence of light black holes or heavy neutron stars to just to avoid the, uh, the interval, but recently, uh, in addition to the seven objects, uh, we have collected 14 candidates to be inside the gap. And one of them, uh, some of them are very interesting. For example, the first microlensive source at the halo is a black hole of 3.79 solar masses and so on. Uh, there's an object called the unicorn in Monoceros. This is very, very funny because you know that Monoceros is a unicorn <laughs> in, in, in the Roman. Uh, constellations. Uh, what did they mean? The unicorn in Monoceros is so strange, so odd, uh, that this is a unique uh, thing. And this unicorn in Monoceros is not a crating. They identify them by the shifting of, of the of the of the companion uh, using the Gaia data, which is uh, able to measure much much better than millisecond arc milli arc second accuracy. Therefore, you can start to play now the game played by Basil and company many, many years ago to 
take a look at the shifting and the uh, motion, motion of Sirius A and infer with that the presence of the white dwarf Sirius. Now you can do it with a black hole, which does not shine at all. And then um, when you analyze that, this is my last topic. Uh, this is a unicorn. So th this is the range which should be nothing. And therefore you uh, wonder if the desert gap is real or is rather a depleted region in which you find less object, but it's not depleted, it's not worried. Uh, then you, you play some uh, conventional probabilities uh, uh, trying to set up the probability for a desert gap. And you realize that as a, a function, uh, as a function of the lower limit, then you cannot push the uh, lower limit of the gap below 2.6 or 2.5, because otherwise the probability is essentially zero. When you go to the synthetic, so you make simulations of a 10 to the five object or so, and then the difference between the, the dash and the solid line is the probability difference. You quantify this, the p value is 0.14. Therefore, it means that the idea that there are no objects there is, is wrong. So this is a very, very low value that indicates that the objects are there and therefore, the idea that there should not, there, there are no heavy neutron stars and no light black holes is, is wrong. There are some way of producing them, which are the, this category. I insist that the, I didn't take it the full sample. There's a paper in APJ uh, that uh, says all about this. You can do it. Uh, this is very technical, but you can set, for example, a, a constant density of them, uh, analyze it uh, uh, by the Bayesian, uh, uh, techniques, and then you find exactly the same. So it's a very, very high likelihood that uh, the idea that the, the, those objects are all mistakes is, is wrong. So the, the objects are there, and then you have to face what what is the production. Uh, the last topic is we have taken the now 35 black holes, analyze the uncertainties in the mass, which is the violin diagrams here, uh, set the new distribution with the probably uh, probability density function. And we find that the uh, peak has moved somewhat to the lower uh, limit because of the presence of the newest uh, candidates, okay? <coughs> With respect to the, what is, was done 10, 12 years ago. And uh, this answers your question, by the way. There are certain things due to inclination, uh, blah, 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 and so are all, all contained in this violent flux, okay? What the interesting thing here, and this is the last one, is that when you, when you go and do the same with the gravitational wave sample of 150 or so, right? Then you realize that the extragalactic population is, has two peaks. One peak is the same as it, the local one, but there is another big one uh, around 33.86 solar masses. So we don't know what the population is. So why is, uh, we should have expected that the production of black holes here says something about the production of black holes at the redshifts one or two, of course. But however, we have something to say about that. In a simulation we have uh, done about uh, uh, the uh, cosmological formation of binaries, including metallicity and initial mass function. And you see that with when you go up in redshift, I mean, one, two or so, the peak goes to uh, masses which are pretty much uh, the ones you measure. So therefore you're collecting uh, binaries in which the mean mass is increasing with increasing redshift. Therefore the ones that you pick up at uh, Z equal to two or something have a mean of 50 something. And the ones that they are around one, is, uh, uh, is around 40. Uh, and then it, it should explain, hopefully, uh, why the, there is a second uh, distribu maximum of the distribution, a very ho uh, heavy population of black hole that you don't see around in, in, our, in our galaxy because we are at Z equal to zero and therefore the prog progenitors speak around 20 speakers. Okay, and this, uh, by the way, here you can see it. The maximum mass uh, is uh, between 15 and 20. Therefore, it may be that there is an evolution of the progenitors, the binaries, 
holding black holes that after that, after a lot of time, coalesce and give rise to the gravitational signals. So you have to, uh, I mean, why is this peak also present? We don't know. It shouldn't be, but it's there. Therefore, there's another quandary that you we have to, to solve. Okay, this is the very last minute. So the last, uh, what is this? Is the report by Doroshenko and company of a very odd object inside a supernova remnant uh, called SJ whatever, um, with a very unusual uh, low mass around 0.77 solar masses and radius. So it's, it's here and you say, okay, you can explain it with the conventional models, but not the mass, because as, as I told you before, the minimum mass that neutron stars could have is around 1.1 or something. You cannot go down all the way to 0.77. Therefore, this leads you to, to think that it may be a, an, an, uh, an exotic object, mainly a neutron star, uh, a strange star with a self-bound equation of state, which goes all the way. So. My contention here is that uh, some time ago, 2021, we collected a few equations of the state that explain very nicely the nicer data. And then we go, we go to the same plot and put the new object at one sigma level, which is this blue uh, square here or rectangle. And uh, it's a kind of prediction that if you have, you're able to form a 0.77 strange star, its radius, it will be around 10, sorry, 10 kilometers. So it doesn't mean it is a, new, as a strange star, but it means that if the measurement is okay, then you have to take a, a closer look. And of course, people is doing it right now. There's another report of one solar masses uh, by a Chinese group that has a completely different technique. But maybe we are on the verge of taking a look at very low mass objects that may tell us something very important about the composition of matter above the nuclear saturation density. So it may be, it may not be. So if you insist that this is a conventional star, it's okay. But then you have to explain why the mass is so low. Because there's no reason, there's no way in the simulations to blow up almost everything and leave half of the mass of the putative neutron star only and the rest going away. This is not expected, or not, no, not more. Okay, this is my last, so my conclusions. We don't still know what the crab over, it's a millennium of thinking, but no firm conclusions. Uh, even that uh, Kenichi Nomoto they insists over the years that it's a, uh, an electron capture supernova. We are not sure of that. It, it may be, but it's, there are some problems there. Never ever talk in your lectures, I never had the pleasure to have a class with, with Zelemos, but I believe that he, he says, and there is a canonical mass of neutron stars of one point four solar mass. Don't believe him because this is there's nothing canonical in solar mass, in, in neutron star masses, which is, is a, a preferred mass of one point four with more than half of the objects, but there are lighter and a lot of heavier object which are uh, confirmed right now. Uh, the mass gap uh, does not exist. It's being filled. Uh, the lower limit, if it exists, is something like 2.4 solar masses or so. Uh, the spider systems are candidates to close look. Low mass bl black, uh, black holes may exist and may be hidden because we, we never look at them. When people uh, got a candidate, for, uh, for example, a binary, of uh, accreting or dark oil, they say, okay, maybe a black hole. It immediately puts as a lower limit for the mass by from the scratch, 10 solar masses. Therefore, if the, the, solar, the black hole is actually three solar masses, the analysis will be completely different, but still consistent. Therefore, you have to reanalyze or rethink the uh, prejudice that the black holes have been are above five solar masses or so. This is not so. So no, I mean the the unicorn and many other candidates, at least three of them, are uh, indications that they may be a hidden population. The plot thickens for the description of their of uh, dense matter. We don't know what to do. They, on the one hand, you have to go up to two point five solar mass. On the other hand, 
there's there are reports were disturbing uh, about the low mass uh, objects that we don't know what they are. And the last one is that the galactic black holes and extra galactic fusions of black holes are different, but there's an extra population which is very, very uh, firm, firmly present in the data. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, that may be explained by serial evolution uh, arguments, but it does not explain why the lighter population is separated at high redshift. And in our galaxy, the, the, big, the, the big ones are, are totally absent. Okay, so this is my last question. Thank you very much again for your invitation and I hope it will go. Thank you. Yeah. We have some time for questions. <clears throat> questions have been already yeah, been collected. Like, David is terrified and Lumos is, is deaf and <laughs> doesn't, he doesn't say anything. So it's, it's very dangerous at that, at that point. It was clear uh, what I tried to say about the extragalactic population. There, there's something hidden there. So it's a lot of things to put your hands and you know <laughs> try try things because it's uh, it, it's really interesting. The the fourth uh, run uh, by LIGO will probably have two or three hundred more, and therefore you can do good statistics uh, more better than the ones that you have here. Given that you have 35 systems in the galaxy, uh, it, it, it's, a, that's, it's an important improvement. You will have probably 10 times as much black hole candidates with good measurements through the chirp mass and, and the, and the uh, wave form. Bias, higher mass because They say there is not, but that should be considered too. I'm not going to say anything strong about the data analysis because this is not my area. But you, if you take a you know a cursor look at that, and say okay, they're missing something. There may be some bias around that. But but you see that the gravitational wave uh, events also contain uh, also contain here light objects in the sense of uh, three or maybe more. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention uh, that. But there's a problem of 1908-14, GW 1908-14, with that mystery of the 2.6 solar mass. Then you have noticed that according to our statistical analysis, it should be a different size. <laughs> and and it may not, may not be a black hole, but it may be a black hole too. So it doesn't really matter, but as long as you, you know, uh, realize that this is a 2.6 solar mass, plus minus a small number. And then it's either the, the heaviest neutral star or the lightest uh, black holes at, at high redshift. We should be taking, you know, looking at uh, more objects like that, like the, the unicorn, which is definitely three something solar mass. Therefore, they say, okay, it's a black hole. But what if, if you measure 2.5? <laughs> then you, you don't know where to put it. But uh, for, uh, that's why the, uh, local uh, galactic uh, systems are, are uh, in some sense more interesting than the the, old, the the gravitational wave ones because you can go and measure again try another thing and so on it may help to you know put the things straight okay so i mean we started a bit late so it's fair to give one more minute for questions if anybody has any Just then, out of curiosity, very quickly, if I may. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Sorry. So it's it's about this, like the different dogmas. Like for us, it was like really interesting. Well, I was, you know, somewhat bold in that. Uh, but I hope the religious I... people is not offended. But it's not the only dogmas that we we have uh, to say. So the political ones are even stronger. <laughs> yeah, and I was more thinking that like, how often do you encounter these ideas in people? Like, is it like often that you find somebody believing? One of those things because they have uh, I, I can tell you that Kuhn is right. Uh, even the slightest modification in that uh, deeply um, uh, believed idea takes a lot of time to question, not just to, it may be wrong. I mean, things may be wrong and maybe, but for example, the idea that neutron star exists in a variety of masses is, is obvious that it's not like that because we have more data 
and they cannot be wrong at all. So they have hundreds of events. But however, you hear people saying, putting up canonical neutrons, for example, GW1708, I didn't bring it, but GW1708 are actually all analyzed saying that it was a symmetric system because people reason. Okay, two neutron stars, one point star, this gives you 2.74 for the total mass the measure, by the shape mass. And then you have a symmetric system. Actually, I calculated what with this distribution, which is the odds that uh, two neutron stars belong to the same thing. And what I, I got is that the probability is more than 50%, almost 60%, that the system was asymmetric. So that uh, limits on the uh, deformability and so on is not to be applied to uh, asymmetrical system. Maybe we have 1.2 and Six or okay, so it's assuming that automatically that you have uh, a symmetrical system means that you're still in 2000, so 25 years ago, thinking that all stars have 1.4 solar masses, and this affects your uh, evaluation of, of new uh, things like the compressibility and, and many other things. Okay, so it's, 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 a, it's a problem of sociology of the academy. The academy is very, very conservative. Everything you say, some of which is not, even if you prove it and say, okay, here's, here's the data. I say, no, 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 it couldn't be, the astronomers do it, do it all wrong and therefore it's unreliable and so on, yeah. <laughs> which is not, not that wrong. <laughs> anyway, at, at some point you have to take a look at that and to confirm what is right and what is wrong or what is uh, firm and which is has some you know uh, range okay thank okay, you so even the time yeah let's thank our speaker again i will be thank you if you enjoyed the video like and subscribe